Does your life have joy? Is your heart truly filled with joy? I am the true vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you are looking for happiness, for true joy that does not depend on circumstances, you need to look to Jesus because he wants to give you his joy. And not only does he want to give you joy, but God, the creator of the universe, Jesus, who resurrected from the dead, wants your joy to be complete. Abide in him and he will abide in you. And from our true vine, you will bear fruit in abundance. I'm going to invite you to pick up your message notes uh, this morning. Uh, they're on the seats, uh, or open your Bible to the passage we're going to be looking at, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Many times in message notes, you'll know there's places to fill out blanks and this and that. I didn't do that this weekend because uh, we're going to dive into a passage, and I'm going to ask you hopefully to kind of look at the passage as we work our way through it. Uh, uh, back, in, back in the old days, people would, uh, generally speaking, bring a Bible to the to the church, and we could write in the Bible. I've noticed over the last uh, 10 years, uh, most people look at the Bible on their app or some other electronic device, and it's not so easy to write anymore. So I, I go old school here. We give you a paper with the Bible in it. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along. Uh, Billy Graham's ministry spanned over 60 years. Uh, I can't think of a, an individual that impacted the cause of Christ more than probably he did. Uh, uh, not long before he died, he was invited to speak at a luncheon in North Carolina. And uh, he got up to, to share some thoughts after an amazing array of accolades were uh, said about him. And this is what he said. I'm reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist who this month has been honored by Time magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching the tickets for every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached into his vest pocket, but he couldn't find his ticket, so he reached into his trouser pockets. It wasn't there. So he looked in his briefcase, but he couldn't find it. Then he looked in the seat beside him, he still couldn't find it. The conductor said, uh, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively, and then the conductor continued down the car, punching the other tickets. As the conductor was ready to move to the next car, he looked back, and he noticed Dr. Einstein on his hands and knees underneath the seats looking for his ticket. The conductor raced back and said, Dr. Einstein, don't worry, don't worry. I know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am, but what I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> Dr. Graham continued, you see the suit I'm wearing, he said, it's a brand new suit. My family's been telling me I've gotten a little sloppy in my old age, so I used to be a lot more fastidious. I went out and bought a new suit for this luncheon and one more occasion. Do you know what that occasion is? This is the suit in which I will be buried. But when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to remember the suit I'm wearing. What I want you to remember is this. I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. Perhaps one of the greatest blessings of being a Christ follower is having the absolute assurance of eternal life. That, my friends, is what I'm calling today the ultimate end game. The last time I checked... The mortality rate among the human race is running about 100%. Every single one of us, at some point, we will breathe our last and pass from this life into eternity. The Bible says that this life is, is just a vapor. Someone once described it like this. If you were to stretch a rope from Costa Rica all the way across the Pacific Ocean to Japan, the time that we spend here on, in this life, 
would not even amount to one inch. The vast majority of the life that we will experience will be in eternity. So it behooves us to have some concrete answers about what will happen in eternity. Once again, this is one of the incredible blessings of being a Christ follower. Jesus said that he's going to prepare a place for us in heaven. And Jesus told us that he himself is the only way to get there. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. This is King Jesus speaking. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is preparing a place in heaven, and he tells us he's the only way to get there. Jesus said this. Um, remember, this is King Jesus speaking. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever believes in the Son, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. In other words, believing in Christ is the only way to secure a place in heaven. The most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Because of God's great love for every human being, every one of us, everyone in the Central Valley, everyone in this entire nation, he sent his Son, Jesus, on a rescue mission. Jesus lived a perfect life. The only human being who did not sin. And because he did not sin, he could die in our place to pay the penalty for our sin. He took upon himself the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And he did that so that we wouldn't be eternally separated from God. But to receive that gift of God's grace, to reserve our place in heaven, we need to believe what Jesus did for us. Earlier I quoted from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, Without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So faith is, is required for us to engage and receive this gift of grace. And the Bible makes it clear, very clear, that when we place our faith in Christ, in that finished work of Christ, we become children of God. Our name is written in the book of life. And we're given the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, friends, of our future place in heaven. So the ultimate end game is where we'll end up in eternity. Being perfect with Christ in eternity. Billy Graham was certain about where he was going. He had placed his faith in Christ, and as a result of that, he knew where he was going, and he knew uh, that, that announcing that would allow others to come to faith. And man, oh my, man, in, in his lifetime, he, I think somebody said over a billion people heard the name of Jesus because of Billy Graham. He preached to so many. And that's a part of Paul's focus in our chapter, in our verse, verses that we're going to look at in Philippians today. This is the seventh uh, message in this uh, series on Philippians. We've been marching right through the book. We've chosen the title, Choose Joy, because over and over again, joy bubbles up in this beautiful short book of Philippians. And I don't think I, I can imagine anything that brings more joy at least to me, than the thought of being with Jesus face to face, being made like Him, and being in a place where there's no more tears, no more pain, no more struggle, no more inflation, no more having to reconcile checkbooks, no more, you know, I mean, it's going to be great because we're going to be with Jesus and it's all going to be all right. So we read Philippians chapter 3 beginning in verse 12. Paul writes, not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, as we survey this passage, there are so many themes in here, but one that I want to draw out is the repeated emphasis over and over again on this end game, the, the being in God's presence eternally and being made perfect in that moment with Christ. The first reference is in verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal. So he's talking about arriving at a goal. This refers back to the previous text when Paul mentions that uh, his desire was to know Christ and, and the resurrection, attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul's writing this. Obviously, he's not resurrected from the dead yet. He's still in the process of looking forward to that final consummation of, of his salvation. As we scan through the pages of Scripture, we see that the Bible talks about salvation in three senses, a past, a present, and a future. In my case, on November 25th, 1975, in my cousin's house, that was the night I received Jesus as my Savior. That's a past event. That's when I became a Christ follower. That's when I entrusted my life to, to, to Jesus. Theologically, that was called the moment of regeneration. But in the past 47 years, God has been cleaning me up, step by step, bit by bit by bit helping me to become more and more like Christ. That ongoing process of salvation is theologically known as sanctification. But the day will come when we who are in Christ will be made perfect. Friends, that's going to be beautiful. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known, but this is... He goes on to say, but when he appears, when Jesus appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is the final moment in, in the salvation process where we are made perfect and we are like him. We will see him because we will be like him. And that final step in this process is called glorification. So that, the, the first reference to the ultimate in game, we've just seen. The second reference is in verse 12. And he, puts in the, he writes this, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So looking ahead at this ultimate end game, to be in Christ, to be with Christ and in heaven forever. So why did Christ take hold of us? Good question, comes out of the passage. Why did he leave heaven, come to earth, and die on the cross? He did all that to make us Perfect like Him so that we could be with Him in eternity. Jesus says this in John 14 and verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Jesus is going to take us to be with Him. And we will be with Him for all eternity. That just blows my mind away. Third reference to the ultimate end game is also in verse 13 straining toward what is ahead straining toward what is ahead Paul's looking toward something that's up ahead the, the day when he crosses that, that finish line he's focused on crossing the final tape in this race of life that's the consummation of his salvation he's looking ahead 
a fourth reference to this ultimate end game is in verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul is using the imagery here of a track race. He's pressing on to take hold of that which Christ has called him into. The prize is the most precious gift we could ever receive. That gift of, of being in God's presence permanently forever and be made like Christ. Now, people all around us, including us, we chase after all kinds of things, don't we? We chase after money, we chase after sex, we chase after this, that, or the other thing. And those things that we chase after never, never fully satisfy this gnawing inside our soul. A few years ago, Pastor Erwin McManus wrote a powerful book called Soul Cravings. And in that book, he talks about these insatiable craving for significance that humans chase after, that we chase after. Far too often, we, we chase after the wrong things to fill this void in us. But in contrast to those wrong pursuits, Paul here, I mean, it's like he's laser focused. He wants to cross that finish line. He wants to see Christ. He wants to be with Christ in his presence. A fifth reference to this ultimate end game is in verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. He's talking again about this ultimate end game of being with God in heaven and being made perfect Two of our kids were born when we were in Chile as missionaries, Jenny and Tommy. And for a season in their lives, they had two passports. They had a Chilean passport and a U.S. passport. And whenever we traveled, we, had, we would travel on two passports with them. When we went into the States, they went under the U.S. passport. When they kept, got back to Chile, they came in on their Chilean passports. Uh, so there was a time when they had dual citizenship. Uh, but then eventually that lapsed when they turned 18 and, and uh, their Chilean passport lapsed. There's a sense that we could say that right now we, we have dual citizenship if we're in Christ. Uh, we have a citizenship uh, here on the earth, an earthly citizenship, and a heavenly citizenship. But there's a time that's going to pass when that earthly citizenship will pass away and, and we will have only one citizenship. That's our heavenly citizenship. That's the one that matters. That's the one that lasts, friends. Sixth reference to this ultimate end game, verse 20. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So all through this passage, I'm trying to show that Paul is focused on this, this ultimate end game, being with Christ in eternity, made perfect like Him. Now this text refers to us from there. That's where Jesus is coming from. This is a beautiful reference to the return of Jesus. Romans 8.34 says that right now Christ is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. So right now, Jesus is in heaven interceding for us. That's a pretty cool thought. Let that swim in your soul for a while. Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for me. Right now, He's praying for us. But the Scripture says that there's going to come a time when He'll return to earth. This is the most frequently repeated prophecy in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that Jesus will come back again. I love how it's described in 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. That's Jesus, King Jesus. With a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. This is called the rapture, the time when the church is taken up out of this earth, meets Jesus, and we will reign and rule with him forever and ever. That's the second coming. Friends, this is a beautiful, beautiful uh, reference here. Well, again, Paul is talking throughout this passage about the ultimate end game, the time when we will be with Jesus in eternity. Seventh and final reference in verse 21. The Lord will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. We talked about this a moment ago. This is this final process uh, in this uh, salvation process, the, the glorification when our bodies will be made perfect like Him. So the entire passage is laced with, uh, with references to the ultimate end game that is becoming perfect like Christ and being with Him forever. I know that sometimes 
Christians have been accused of being so heavenly minded there, no earthly good. And, and I know there's balance here and we need to be concerned about things in this culture here and now. We need to be fighting for justice and eradicating poverty when we can and reaching the lost. All these things are very, very important. But I, I love the way it was so poignantly phrased by C.S. Lewis years ago when he said, if we aim at heaven, we get earth thrown in. But if we aim at earth, we will miss both. If we aim at heaven, we get thrown in. We put our minds, we fix our minds on this ultimate end game, being with Christ forever, being transformed into His perfection. But if we aim at earth, if we focus on earth, we might end up missing both. Paul's passion in this passage, I think, is unmistakable, friends. He's relentless in his pursuit for this ultimate end game of, of being with Christ in eternity and being made perfect like Christ. Look at all the ways he describes this. And this is where I'd invite you to take your notes and circle or underline these phrases. In verse 12, he writes, I press on. You might circle that phrase. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Pressing on in, in, in implies intentionality, doesn't it? Uh, discipline, persistence. Verse 13, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Underline that. Forgetting what is behind. The Greek term here used is, it means to fully forget, to completely forget. It's just to put it behind us because that's not important. What's important is up ahead, being with Christ. Also in verse 13, circle the word straining toward what is ahead. Just that one word, straining. Can you get the idea of the muscles and the sinews straining? So spiritual progress is being made as we prepare for heaven. Now in verse 14 again, I press on, press on. Again, same phrase used as in verse 12. Pressing on implies intentionality. Verse 17, join together, following my example, he says. Follow, you might underline or circle that. Paul's passionate pursuit to become like Christ and to be fit for heaven. He sets himself up as an example and he calls us to look at people, follow people that are with that same intentionality. And then in verse 18, he talks again about these false teachers. We talked about those last week. And I, I mentioned a few weeks ago that one of the things that happens when you preach through an entire book of the Bible or you, you preach through an entire long passage in the Bible is you're forced to deal with things that might be a little bit uncomfortable. You're forced to deal with things that, uh, golly, I'd like to stand up here and talk to you every day about the love of God. That's beautiful. I love to talk about the love of God. But there are some other parts of Scripture that are important. And these false teachers, he says, live as enemies of the cross because they teach a works-based salvation. The true gospel is Christ alone by faith alone. It's not Christ plus anything. It's Christ alone through faith alone. And we mentioned a week or so ago that these false teachers were known as Judaizers. They taught that a person needed to embrace Christ plus the law yeah, Paul says in verse 19 that their God is their stomach and their mind is on earthly things. Bottom line, be careful. Don't get sidetracked with false teaching. Be passionate about the things that are most important. And in this passage, Paul is saying what's most important is that we keep our eyes focused on Christ, becoming like Him and being fit for heaven when we will be with Him forever. Verse 20, Paul writes, We eagerly await. You might circle that. We eagerly await. Paul is longing for the return of Jesus like a kid waiting on Christmas to open his packages. He, he, he just can't wait. Paul is eagerly awaiting a Savior from there. Finally, in chapter 4 and verse 1, stand firm in the Lord. Right at the end of that, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm means not moving, being resilient, being persistent. Standing firm. All of these things demonstrate Paul's what I would call white hot pursuit of being made into Jesus' likeness and being prepared for heaven. The, so my question in this one point sermon is how do you pursue these things yourself? Being made like Christ, being prepared for heaven. If the ultimate end game is that we would be made like Christ 
and be prepared to live eternally with Him, how do you pursue these things? Another way I could ask this is, is how do you develop in you? How do you grow spiritually to prepare yourself for heaven? Now, each of us is different. We recognize that in most areas of life, but I'm not sure we always recognize it in the spiritual arena. Each of us are wired uniquely and differently. And because of that, each of us tend to connect with God in unique ways. And I think it's important for us to begin to have a self-awareness to understand that we each connect with God and grow spiritually in different ways. One size does not fit all. One way of connecting with God will not fit all. I love the way one of my favorite authors, Pastor John Ortberger, he writes it. He says this, There is enormous freedom in identifying and embracing your spiritual pathway. It's like realizing that if you're an introvert, you don't have to work as a salesman. You can get a job in a library. I like that. You don't have to beat yourself up or feel guilty because of what is not your pathway. You can focus on relating to God in that way for which you were made. So very briefly this morning, let me describe some spiritual pathways and see if you connect with one of them. The intellectual pathway. Some people draw closer to God as they learn and as they study and as they dive into theology. And in small groups, these are the people that always want to go deeper. And what's that word mean in the Greek? And what's it beyond that? And some people are just wired that way. Other people, it's a relational pathway. These are the people that get their greatest sense of God's presence when they're connecting with others and in small groups often they'll want to hold hands and they'll want to connect and they'll want to listen and they'll want to talk and they'll want to sing kumbaya that's the relational pathway okay <laughs> and then there's the serving pathway i know some people in this group that are serving pathway. these people experience god most by helping others these are the folks that are in small groups and they're always encouraging the group to go and serve the homeless and and help in these ways they connect with god most by tangibly serving the Lord. The worship pathway, worship pathway. These are folks that love to connect with God through music and through worship. And you come to church and you, you're sitting here thinking, well, why am I not so excited about singing and worship as much as Lucho is up here leading? And you're thinking, is there something wrong with me? No, it might be that your, your pathway to connect with God is not necessarily the worship pathway. That's okay. We're all different. As long as you find the pathway that allows you to connect more deeply with God. Uh, another pathway, the contemplative pathway. People with this wiring need lots of time quiet and alone. I, I, I think that I've got a contempt, contemplative wiring in me. I mean, I connect with God most when I'm all alone in my backyard, experiencing God, you know, just me and Him. We're like, it's, 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 it's really beautiful. Or the creation pathway. These are the folks that find God in the beauty of His creation. And uh, they, they experience closeness to God in that. And I think this maybe is one of the reasons that I've enjoyed hiking and backpacking so much. A few weeks ago when we were climbing Chiripo, Man, I found a creation pathway to God, especially that last 200 meters when I'm going, God, help me, get me up here. <laughs> so each of us is wired differently, okay? You need to discover how you connect with God. But look back at the passage here, okay? The passage says in verse 12, press on. In verse 13, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead. And then again in verse 14, press on. Do these terms... Describe how you're walking out your spiritual life right now. Are you pressing on? No matter your pathway, but are you pressing on? Or are you straining toward what is ahead? We all have different pathways. We've already talked about that. 
But within the pathway or pathways that God has wired you with, are you diligently exercising uh, the pursuit of knowing Christ and being made in His likeness, preparing you for eternity? The, the Taj Mahal is arguably one of the most beautiful and costly tombs that was ever, bi ever built. In 1629, the favorite wife of this Indian ruler, Shah Jahan, died. And he was so moved by her death that he decided to build this elaborate, beautiful tomb to honor her. So, as I understand the story, he placed her casket in the middle of this large tract of land, and they began building this extensive memorial to her. A few years into the building process, uh, the Shah's grief for his wife gave way to his passion for the project, and along the way at some point, apparently, as I've been told, he was walking, surveying the elegance of the beauty that was being built, and there was this box in the middle, and he said, get that box out of here. And it wasn't until a few years later that uh, they realized, he realized, that they had actually tossed out her casket. He lost sight of what this was all about. That could happen in our spiritual lives, I think, fairly easily. What do you need to do to press on in the spiritual pathway that God has wired into you this week? Do you need to stop watching television? Some? More? Less? Do, do, you, do you need to say no to something so that you can say yes to, to receiving His grace in the wiring that He's given you? Do you need to make yourself more accountable to somebody so that you'll, you'll actually spend time in your devotional life nurturing this inner life with Christ? What do you need to do so that you can pursue with the same intentionality as the Apostle Paul who was laser focused on becoming like Christ and being prepared so that when he walked into eternity, he was ready. Father in heaven, these are weighty questions. And I'm asking now that through the grace and mercy of your Holy Spirit, you would lead us all to make one or two decisions that would Set us up this week to pursue Jesus more fully. There's so many distractions, Lord, you know them. They get in our way. And we're busy from morning to night. Frenetically busy. And often we miss this beautiful invitation of just resting with you. So, Father... Clear our minds, clear our calendars, clear space in our soul so that this ultimate end game can be our focus this week. Being made like Christ, being prepared to join Him in eternity. Thank you for Paul's example and thank you for the way it seriously challenges us here today. And we... Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.